I think it's, it's always helpful to agree on the terms before we argue about them too much. I think it's helpful to distinguish between effective laws of physics on one hand and fundamental laws of physics on the other hand. So if you take fundamental laws of physics to be something which by definition can't change, then you know, effective laws of physics could be like popping, jumping from one vacuum in a, in a theory to another, uh, something like that. And in, mm -hmm. in, in that case, uh, it's uh, not particularly speculative. I mean, at least you, ha you have even conservative people like Raphael, you know, who, <laughs> so who, who, know. who study theories where you start in one effective set of laws of physics and, and end up in others. The point I was trying to make is, is not that there isn't some sort of continuity between the more fundamental laws, meta laws, if you like, in the, in the superstructure that is generating the universes, uh, but, that, that, but the thoroughly platonic nature of that assumption that you have to buy into the notion of eternally existing, immutable, infinitely precise mathematical relationships underpinning all this. And there is no possibility of ever testing such a thing experimentally. It's purely an act of faith to suppose they're there. It's one that almost all scientists make. It may be right, but it always is good, I think, in science to challenge tacit assumptions that cannot be experimentally tested. And uh, just one more thing I'd like to, where I'd like to actually agree with Paul, and I think you and I might be the only two people in this room who, sh who share this particular concern. I, I, uh, th I love, you know, the continuum and real numbers, and they're really cool to do math with and stuff, but you know, we've never managed to measure anything to better than 16 decimal places, and I personally don't believe that there is any such thing as true real numbers in, in nature that take an infinite amount of information to describe. But, and, and in the spirit of what you said, Paul, that if there is something which can't be computed or even stored, you know, in our whole universe, I feel very uneasy about assuming it exists. I think there's even a very interesting historical precedent there, where in the quantum mechanics, we had a situation where there was some stuff which was initially present in the mathematical formalism, namely the notion that you could have a particle could have a perfectly defined position and momentum. And then Einstein and Bohr and others realized that, well, even if it was supposed to be in there, you could never actually measure those two at the same time. And then later, we actually got a deeper understanding which replaced the whole mathematical formalism by one where that stuff that wasn't measurable wasn't even there. Right, so this and is now another we, source of uncertainty. And now we have the same situation with our qubits because we know you can never get more than one classical bit out of them and you can never store more than two classical bits in them with ultra-dense coding. Yet, to, to mathematically describe a qubit, you need uh, two real numbers, theta and phi, yeah, within so the exponentially bits. more mathematical description. And I would yeah. agree with you, I think. And my guess is that this is just something we haven't understood well enough. Right. And then, so the question is, if that is a real limitation, how do we test it? You know, I had hoped the 400 entangled particles, I'm prepared to, to believe Scott, uh, that, uh, that maybe everything we can do or everything that the universe can do with that. I came, came to think about this just uh, from wondering whether by uh, imploding a ball of entangled particles you could exceed the Hawking, uh, uh, you know, the entropy of the black hole by uh, losing more information than, than you would throwing in classical bits and would soon told, no, no, that isn't the case. We only ever deal with classical bits. Uh, Paul, I find your discussion interesting. I think it's useful to distinguish laws from meta laws. There's a series of principles we have, like symmetry principles, variation principles, statistical laws, which we assume will apply whatever the laws of physics are. And the interesting question is, where do those meta principles come from? Why do they apply to all the laws we have? Right, so, so I was using, you know, meta laws in the, really in the sense of the more fundamental set that would be in the bigger entity that would uh, generate the universes and then distribute the effective laws among them. But, but it's true, but, they, but you know, in that discussion about where they come from, it's, uh, you're never to be led to, I mean, it's the Tower of Turtles again, and that you have to decide where to stop, where do these, what, what, what's, I've, j just to sort of throw in another remark, I, I've often wondered, that could we write down a rather small list of fundamental principles of that, that nature and in effect constrain the laws of physics that are permissible. So we might want no closed time world, world, like, no closed time -like world lines, uh, no perpetuum mobile, uh, and uh, no naked singularities or something. We can imagine having a list of those and, and maybe those global principles would be enough to constrain the local physics. But you can only have no close time like world lines if you've already got the concept of a space-time. Sure. Yeah.
Okay, so I would like to poll the panel members on the question of, do you think that n years from now, when we finally know why there's narrow time and the early universe had a low entropy, will the concept of the multiverse play a crucial role in that understanding? To go first? Yes or no? Given the talk I gave, I clearly have to answer yes. I'll say yes. And it's the truth, I believe that. I'll say yes. And I think yes, although the other universes might just be imaginary, but uh, they will play a useful role in, uh, what, in the possibilities, exploring yeah, the space of possibilities. And I'm going to have all you, but you can only say yes or no. There's a paper I have with me by a philosopher called Mark Lange that discusses whether this is always the case or whether one can, can genuinely have time-dependent laws and comes to the conclusion you can genuinely have time-dependent laws, uh, but that will not be an example of them. But what Wheeler was after was something a bit different. He was not saying that the laws are changing with time, but that they uh, congeal over time. So there's a sort of arrow of time towards uh, growing precision in the laws. So it starts out higgledy-piggledy, as he, he put it, fuzzy, uh, and then as the universe evolved, presumably over a rather short period of time at the beginning, these laws focused in on their, their final set. And then what he wanted to know was why did they focus in on a, a bio-friendly set, a participatory universe, as he put it. He had all this sort of feedback loop stuff, which people here are obviously not taking seriously, and perhaps they shouldn't take it seriously, but that, that was his agenda. And so this was a different form of time dependence. This was a time dependence in the level of precision with which the laws could be implemented. Uh, yes, so uh, if, uh, and the toy model I was talking about was one in which we look at the computational resources of the universe, they would have been less at that early time. And so that become, then becomes an issue about what about the exponential nature of inflation? You very soon get big numbers there. Uh, and so when you actually look at that, at the time of inflation, look at the total number of bits in the universe, uh, is about 10 to the 20. And so then you might expect to get an inflation factor of 10 to the 20, which is a bit marginal for doing the job with inflation. But it's not totally hopeless. And so one can imagine that that might be testable if, uh, if you're allowed 10 to the, 10 to the 20 inflation factor. Maybe that leaves an imprint in the CMB, I don't know. That's just, just an example. Well, on, that, on that example, uh, I mean, it, it, you, you never get into a confusion about this if you think about, what, if you think about the causal patch. Right? The, the, mm -hmm. the full scale of what inflation produced can only be seen at very late times, at which point there's also plenty of, of, of entropy in the universe. So, uh, so it, it doesn't matter how long inflation lasted. There's never an inconsistency in terms of there being too much information inside somebody's causal path. So the, so the, the uh, original claim by Alan Guth that you need 10 to the 24 or whatever it was uh, uh, inflation factor in order to solve the horizon flatness, etc. problems is not true. Is that what you're saying? You, 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 of course you need that much inflation ah. to solve the horizon flatness problem, but, but that is a problem that appears to an observer who lives at the current age of the universe. Ah. That problem is not at all apparent. At that, if, if you lived at, at a thousand years after the Big Bang, the problem would right. have been a much smaller one and a smaller... Oh, it's simply because the, the gap between the... Uh, yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, that's true. That's true. So I would like to ask a question to Anthony to make the universe a more fair place because he has been secretly laughing at you when you said you were very conservative and then he laughed at the, the two of us too and I would like to out him by asking him a question so we, can, we can see how conservative he really is because you, you confessed in a weak moment of, out there that you had a discussion about what it feels like to be a Boltzmann brain you know when you're at the yeah. piano at the moment when your consciousness kind of switches on uh, could you elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah so <coughs> So the, the question that we were addressing is not the reasonableness nor utility of Bolton's brains, but merely if you want to wait for one to, to form, what will that look like? And so one tricky question you can think about is whether at any point the, the psychological <coughs> arrow of time that that Boltzmann brain is experiencing becomes misaligned with the thermodynamic arrow of time. That is, if <coughs> so if entropy is 
<coughs> decreasing um, as this brain forms, then so the, so the brain at, at some point is going to start is going to be thinking sort of this way in time. So en entropy is getting smaller as the brain is forming, and but the brain what it's actually going to experience is is entropy increasing in general. Uh, but you can ask whether, as it's about to form, there's some time where the brain would actually be operating uh, one way, and the arrow of time is the thermodynamic arrow of time is pointing the other way. Remember, you've got to get this time reversal. Take your brain right now, this conscious state, time reversal. You will die almost, or you will certainly go unconscious and probably die almost instantly. Reverse your circulation, reverse all the. You're going to die. It's that. There won't be a consciously operating brain a consciously operating Yeah, so I have to reverse, I have to, I have to take the time reverse of my present brain state and then see how that decays to equilibrium. Right. And then I have to time reverse that right, right. to get back. Reverse your present time state, you're going to die almost in science. What? Why? Why? Yeah. Because all, if you're time. Are, are you time reversing only the brain and leaving everything else alone? Or? Well, you are alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just don't understand what possible state of affairs would correspond to discovering that there are no fundamental laws. It may not be a question of there being no fundamental laws, but of finite precision to their efficacy. So then you would see another source of uncertainty in the world. Okay, but, but then there would just be a metal law saying that, okay, this thing gets rounded to finite precision. Right, and the, the reason that, that I just find it appealing uh, if you put this computational bound on the universe is that that's a pure number and it's a natural measure of complexity uh, which, uh, which is given to you by nature. So, but it could be some other thing. is basically predicted for observers who fall into a black hole or who live in a collapsing universe because of the fact that they have only access to a finite number of degrees of freedom. So it had better be... Uh, a description that has a finite uh, level of precision. But I, I, I don't also don't see a contradiction between that and the notion of fundamental laws that just have finite precision. Right, I think that concludes our day here. Thank you.